Well, good evening and special welcome to any of our guests who have come to be with us here tonight. We're glad to have you here at Southside Bible Church. This is always one of my favorite services when all the family and friends come into town. It's just one of my favorite services of the year. So Merry Christmas to all of you and grateful to have you. My golden night is to just make clear how everyone in this place can be blessed abundantly this evening, to have the best Christmas you could ever have, to be full of joy and peace, and that this would be forever more. Because we, why should we be of good cheer? Why should good Christian men and women rejoice? Why should we hark the herald angels sing? Why should we go tell it on the mountain? I tell you, it's not the spirit of Christmas that we're after. It's not when all is right. It's not with the presence or family or food or drink, whatever it is you're looking to fill that void tonight, I seek to give you the, the true answer that can fill what every heart is looking for that has been born into this world. And so I've asked, we don't normally turn off the lights here at Southside Bible Church, but I asked that the AVL group would do that while we look tonight at our verse. And the reason is I want this to just a time to slow down. And just right now with no one else looking at you, just you and God, you, you're alone with God and just right now to just hear this message and deal with your own heart and soul with just Him, the one who knows your heart perfectly. He knows all things. And so tonight we're just going to open up His Word and asking that He would work in each one of our hearts the way we need. So whether you sit alone this Christmas or with many people around you and you're feeling alone or you're filled with a loving house and there's an empty seat at your table, this is what your heart is seeking in all of these shadows. This is what we're looking for. And it's, it's what every Christmas, you, we start out just filled with hope that this is going to fill something and it finishes many times more empty. It's, I always say it's, it's like uh, December, but never Christmas. I have a gift for you tonight, and it's God's gift for you. And I've been praying that everyone tonight would receive this gift and we're going to unwrap it, and that you would receive it by faith tonight. So let me read you the verse that I'm going to go over tonight. It's a very famous verse. It's held up at many sporting events. It's, many have heard it, but I, I think many of us don't understand it rightly. So my prayer tonight is that every heart would understand it, and, and it would open up and be the, the best present that you've ever been given. So let me read to you John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Let's go to our God and pray over this verse. Father, I thank you for this beautiful verse and I thank you for the truth in it. I pray now, Lord, that you would take these words and your Holy Spirit would make them go from just words on a page to the living word. Lord, going from our minds to where we understand them and into our hearts and changing us forever. And so come meet us in John 3.16. We pray tonight. Amen. So turn with me to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible. And, and, and right in the middle of John 3.16 that I just read, this gem, this diamond is dropped in it. Martin Luther said this is the whole gospel in miniature in one verse. And there's some very uh, radical realities that are going on in this chapter. It begins with a, a religious teacher named Nicodemus. And he comes and Jesus says to him, unless you're born again, you will not enter into the kingdom of God. And then, and then he says, unless you get this new birth from above, when God comes into your life and he, he makes you alive to him and to Jesus Christ in this verse that we're going to look at. It's something that what he's saying is you can't do naturally. You, you can't do this. Only God can do it. And he says, unless he does it, you will not be able to see the kingdom of God. It's why Christians are always running around saying you must be born again because Jesus said it. So this isn't a call to just clean up morally and get the outside of the cup looking better. It's a, it's a gospel that goes right to the inside and it makes you new. And it fills you with God and Christ and love and goodness. Jesus said, from the heart flows the springs of life. So in John 3, you must be born again 
to enter into the kingdom of God. And so, if the lights are a problem, just flip them on, man, don't worry. And then we're told that God is pleased to give you eternal life in this chapter by lifting up His Son on a cross. He's going to put His own Son on a cross, and He's going to bear the punishment that we deserve for our sins on that cross. Radical. And if that's not enough, now He drops this verse in. And He says, God loves the world. The whole Old Testament has been revealing this God who is holy and pure, and no one can come into his presence without being consumed. And you're looking at this holy God who's righteous and just, and you just keep seeing he has to punish sin, and these animals are being sacrificed for sin. And now we come and we're told God loves the world. That should astonish us tonight. Our problem is we just feel so cuddly and lovable, and he just ought to love me. It's his job after all. And until this truth that we look at tonight takes your breath away, it takes your heart away, you're just not understanding this truth. And that is the truth that I just want to set out for you this evening. And if you want to understand Christmas, it starts that God so loved the world. And so we have a simple outline that we're going to look at tonight from John 3.16. I want to look at first, what is the source then of this love? And it's God. And then I want to, what is the object of such love? And it's the world. And then three, what is the expression of his love? He gave his only begotten son. And what's the purpose of this love? That we should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so we'll unfold those four, and I'll let you go home and eat ham and have a great night. Hopefully, I, hopefully you, John 3.16 changes everything about your life tonight. It did mine. First, the source of this love is God. This is the fountain that every mercy that has ever come into this world or into your life comes from. It all springs from the eternal source, God. The reason you sit here tonight alive in Him is in, with a hope of glory and eternity is the love of God. You can trace every blessing that you have, go back as far as you can go, and it will end in the heart of God, for God so loved. This is the heart of God. John said God is love. This, this is His very essence of who He is, and all of this springs from Him and his love, and his nature. Look into that manger, and you see that God so loved the world. And so we just start there, and we just marvel tonight. Our God loves. What would this be if he didn't? Could you imagine? Christmas preaches that God loves. And our God is not a transcendent God so far away who is disinterested or detached or a stoic. If you've come here tonight going, he feels so far away. I just want you to hear that. He came near in his son and he loves. And the most precious truth in the universe is that the one who created the universe loved it. And there's this one little particle that I just love. He's so, this is a little Two letters, so, so infinite. Every year, I grow in seeing, oh, I've got like two of them. <laughs> but I love you, brother. And so does God. <laughs> and every year, I just grow in seeing the depth of this word, so. My comprehension of it just keeps growing. There's no end to it. I'm telling you, the rest of your life, you will grow and learn, and it just gets deeper and deeper and greater and greater. He so loved the world, it's infinite. It began in eternity past, and this love goes to eternity future, and Paul says there is nothing that can separate you from this love. It's infinite. <laughs> it's, it's not merited. That's the message to the world. You don't earn it. You can't go out and earn this love. 
It's given. It's, it's, there's a height, Paul said, and a depth and a length and a breadth that no one can measure this love. It's eternal. It's unchanging. It's unending. It's not influenced by us or our performance. It is the most beautiful thing that I've ever learned in all my years of studying. What's the greatest thing you've learned? That God loves. From his heart springs the beauty of Christmas. And I want to flush out this love together because too many times in the church we leave it there and everyone puts their own definition to it and it's, it's not the right definition. God defines it and we're going to open up what is this infinite love of God. So let's look at the second point. The, the object of his love, it says, is the world. <clears throat> so it's amazing that God loves, but what is amazing to me is what he loves or who he loves. And here we're told it's the cosmos, it's the world. And as you do a little word study in the Gospel of John, the way John uses this word is it's the created totality of, of hear this word, of fallen mankind. So it isn't the cuddly crew, it's the fallen ones since Adam sinned that come into this world with just a self-bent uh, against God, defying Him, wanting to please only you. That's who He loved. It's the countless number of perishing people in this text, which is everyone. We're all born of Adam and we come in perishing. And it's this group that tonight we're going to see this whoever comes out of it. Whoever comes out of this group, the ocean of the world, and this whoever will come from it. So this is the world and all of its badness and brokenness and coldness to its creator and disobedience to its God and its apathy to him. It's insulting him that we treat him, that we don't need his son and our good works can get us right with God. It's all insulting him, this world. This world that killed his son when he came into the world to save it, that killed him. His own did not receive him, John says in chapter 1. So what is amazing to me is how God and world could be linked by the word love. Marvel. Do you see how sinful this world was? And do you see how sinful you are? There's a depth to it. And God loved this. And when you look at it, I want you to see that God is under no obligation to love this world. It isn't his job. It's not his duty. He could have existed forever, happy and Trinitarian love with his Son and the Holy Spirit for all of eternity and been fine. He had no obligation to love the world that hates him. And so this is a stunning revelation. You, you could never get this by just looking at the world. You can only get it from the Word of God to understand the mind of God. And so the greatness of the love of God tonight is whom he loves. Sinful humanity that loves everything but him. And so the world needs to be saved. I need to be saved. And so the world is in need of a salvation. I want you to hear this. It needs God's gift. We're alienated and we're opposed to God from the womb. In sin, David says, I was conceived. We are marked by a depravity that we are as broken and as separated as you can be now because we've moved away from God. And there's nothing worthy in us, please hear this, of His love. I have nothing to turn the heart of God to me, just away from me. I am worthy of condemnation, and you need to see your portrait under this heading to ever know the love of God. you got to see that. But God's word tonight declares that he so loved the world. We are unworthy of this love. And, and it was not anything based on us, but it was in God. The source of it was God. And that's the beautiful part because it, it's not you that turned his love and it's not you that can turn his love away from you. 
It's the best news there is, is there's a God who loved. And so hear this tonight, because his love is so large, it's beyond race, culture, groups, neighborhoods. It's, it, I want you to hear this. It's beyond your badness and your brokenness. It's global. This week I was thinking about our love for each other and what usually strains our love for each other. It's knowledge, isn't it? The more you get to know each other, it gets strained. Have you ever, I think the funniest thing I've ever done is premarital counseling. They just sit there smiling and you're trying to tell them it can be hard. There's going to be things you're going to learn about each other. And they just sit there, oh, not us. Like you, you're talking to the wrong people. And then with knowledge, our love gets challenged. In a church body, we get strained love. And many of you at Christmas with family, you feel it. And there's these strains. But I want you to hear this. God's love is not strained by his perfect, infinite knowledge of us. In fact, it's what caused him to act for us in mercy. Marvel that the creator of the universe so loved the world. And the only reason I can have salvation this night is because of that. It's the heart of our God that he loved this world. And I'm in that world. And the spirit must blow, he said at the beginning of this chapter, as he sheds abroad in your heart the love of God in Christ Jesus. And so what I'm praying is that the spirit would be breaking into your heart as you're listening to this, beginning to say, wow. And that love starts to go from external and it gets into your heart. And that's why he said, unless you're born again, you won't in the kingdom of God. That love has to break in. And I pray he blows in your heart right now with any resistance to his love and his gospel and what he gave that, that it would break through. That's why I wanted the lights off so you could deal with it. But God's will is the lights on. Let's go. So the source of this love is God. The object is the world. And the third point is the expression of God's love, the expression of it. So he loved the world. What did it cause him to do? That he gave his only begotten son into the world. Christmas, Easter, <laughs> cross, resurrection, coming again. My friends, affection without action does nothing for us. How many of you uh, have, have your whole life has been filled with people saying, I love you all day long, and they've never lifted a finger to help you? It doesn't do any good if God just has this love in his heart, and he does nothing to help this problem. And so I want you to see his love is so deep and real that it acted, it expressed, it, it sent his son into this world. So it's not just a sentimental love, it's not just words, it's not just hypocritical love. It's the deepest, most infinite, beautiful, perfect love there is. If God just had love for us and it stopped there, it would have done nothing for us. I'm glad that he has love for me in his heart, but what good does that do for me in my predicament of sin and being separated from him? My sin has separated me from God. He can't draw me near in love without punishing my sins. The whole Bible was written saying sins have to be punished. There's got to be justice to come back into the presence of God. Just in, at the end of this chapter, John 3.36, Jesus said, the wrath of God is abiding upon you. Jesus said that. And so how do, I, how do I get out from under that? How do I get out from under the wrath of God for my sin? I'll tell you that he gave. This love in God's heart acted for our good and he gave but who he gave shows the measure of his love. And I want you to look with me at who he gave. His only begotten son. The son that was unlike any other. The one who was fully God. He gave the best relation that he had in the universe. The one who dwelt at his bosom. His best relationship. The one who was daily his delight is who he gave to this world. Words will always come short of how beautiful this gift was that he gave. And, and 
what he gave up. Our, our own children are like strangers compared to the relationship of the Father and the Son. It's the purest relationship. There's none like it. And they had eternal communion, and they were one in every sense of the word. And you could really say that God gave himself. He gave Jesus. And so this gift cost the Father greatly. There's never been a greater or more costly gift in the history of the world. The Father gave up His Son. And I want you to get this for a rebel world. He gave a Son with no rebellion for a world full of rebellion. That is love. And my question tonight is, why would He do that? Why would He do that? For God so loved the world is amazing to make His Son a human garment to wipe up our sin and pollution and heal our relationship with God. He gave him up to be what's called a substitute. Jesus came into the world and said, I will take all the sin of humanity and I will be their representative. And I will, I will be the one who will bear the wrath of God so that they don't have to. I'll be the one that the sword of justice will pierce through for our transgressions. I'll be the one to be a sacrifice. And so the Father gave him up to death to be a ransom, to pay the ransom, to set us free from the bondage of sin and death. The just one for the unjust one, says Peter. John said, this is love, that God sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. That means to appease God's wrath. He sent his son to come and bear his wrath so that you will never have to. He sent His Son to, to get that wrath off of us so we could be forgiven with no condemnation, adopted as children of God. The Father gives Him up. He pulls out His sword of justice and He visits His own Son with wrath and judgment for my sins. He didn't spare Him. So He, he could spare you from the sword. <laughs> Do you hear that? Why? Why? Because he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I have an old illustration that I heard a while back, and I'm going to use it to try to help. I read a story about a Native American tribe. I think it was up in Montana or Dakota. And it, it, this tribe had a crime breakout in the middle of it. And it, and it just kept increasing. And, and they would say, if you get caught, here's the punishment. And it would be like 10 lashes that you would receive and, and it didn't deter the thief, and it just kept going on and on. And finally, it got up to 50 lashes, and the whole tribe knew that no one could endure 50 lashes. It would kill you, except maybe the chief, who was the strongest man in the tribe. And so they finally, one day, they caught the thief. And the thief was the chief's mother. And they all started saying, wait a minute, what's going to happen? Is this chief just? Is he going to give his own mother the 50 lashes and hold to his word and what he said? Or is he going to be merciful and forgive his own mother? And so the next day he's going to give his, his judgment and everyone gathers to say, what's the chief going to do? Is he going to be merciful or just? And he says, 50 lashes, you're guilty. And then he took off his robe and, and bent over the stump and took the 50 lashes and his mom was forgiven and set free. And that is it, is God is saying, there's got to be justice for your sins. And I sent my son into the world to bear the punishment for your sins. That is the love of God, and that's what he gave to us. Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his own love, and that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. The proof of the abundant and infinite love of God is what he did with his only begotten son. He gave him up for us. He delivered him up on a cross to die the worst death known to mankind. The worst that man could do, the worst that the devils could do, and the worst that God the Father could do with his own wrath. That's the gift that God gave to us. And it came in the humblest wrapping paper ever. It came in a manger with no place to lay his head. And it would end in a mock trial and him being put to death on a cross as a sinner in our place. And my question to you tonight, what was his purpose in doing that? 
And that's our last point that we'll look at. That whosoever believes should not perish, but have everlasting life. There is a purpose to such love. And this love now narrows greatly. It starts with the whole cosmos, and now it narrows to out of that group, whoever believes. The blessing of God's love, sending His Son, is for those who believe. The world is perishing. Right after John 3.16 and verse 17, for God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. He who believes in Jesus is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment that the light, Jesus, has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. This is the love of God. Without His gift, without His Son, you will perish. You need to hear this. This is God Himself telling you this in this verse. You will perish without His Son. And to perish means to suffer eternally in what has been known as Gehenna, hell, to lose all the blessings of God and to live under His wrath for eternity in John 3.36. It's described in a way of, in Scriptures that provokes great fear. And many today try to explain this away because it's so horrific and it, and it just it makes your skin crawl. It's so intense. And I want it out of my thinking. And I understand why tonight you might be saying, who is this guy? Get this out of my thinking. This guy is messed up. That's what I did for years. But I want you to hear this. It doesn't remove the reality. If you go out and drink tonight and get this out of your mind, it doesn't fix the reality of what we're talking about. You'll perish without believing in this gift of the Son of God that came and died on a cross on our behalf. So it doesn't matter what your tolerating culture tells you. You need to hear your Creator and what He's telling you. And so what you must do with this tonight is face it and believe what God is saying. Believe that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I just remember the prophet crying out with the heart of God, Oh, Israel, Ephraim, why will you perish? Why will you perish when the God of the universe is holding out a gift? Saying, I sent my son into the world and he went up on a cross and died and I'm offering you eternal life. Why will you perish? Why would a man die of hunger with a loaf of bread in his right hand? This is why Jesus came to this earth. And this is why we hark the herald and angels sing. Because God gave His Son so that we wouldn't perish but have eternal life. God has purposed to have a people who should not perish. And he would, he, would, he would have His own Son perish on that cross so that you would never have to bear what Jesus did to set you free from it. And so He, he just cries out, why then will you perish? My son perished as a substitute in your place. Why will you perish? And Jesus says this, so that you might have eternal life. This is what God loves and desires for you tonight. That you would not perish. He gave his son so that you would, would have eternal life. And my question as we close out, who gets eternal life? As we look at our text, it's really clear that whoever believes. What you do with this gift of love that I've just described, that God has given into the world that was perishing, it's an eternal decision. So as we look at this gift that is Jesus, God's Son, it, this, this decision right now, what am I going to do with Jesus? What am I going to do with the gift of love? It, it's going to be an eternal decision. Either we perish 
or we have eternal life. Man, you came here maybe just thinking, I, I just want to hang out with my family. You've just been brought to the biggest decision of your life. Why will you perish? What you do with Jesus Christ is going to affect your eternity. And so I'm going to spend the rest of our time on this one answer. Because this is the linchpin of it all. Your eternal destiny hangs on what you do with Jesus Christ. And he says, whoever. And I'm just praying that God will let hope fill every heart here tonight with that one word, whoever. Whoever can fit anyone tonight. Anyone who comes in that's in the world, the whoever, you could be that. Whether you're old or young. Whether you've been educated or you're uneducated. Whether you're beautiful or unattractive in this world whether you have no friends or a bunch, whether you got money or you're just poor, whether you are moral and you're better than all your neighbors and you've done all the right things, or whether you're immoral and you're saying, there's no way a God could forgive me. Do you know what I've done, pastor? He's saying, whoever. I don't care where you've been, what you've said or done, God is offering that whoever. There's nothing that can bar you from this. Every other religion, you gotta be good you got to clean yourself up and be better. This is the offer for every sinner, whoever will receive this and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. Whether you came willing or unwilling this night, whether you've spent a whole life rejecting him again and again and again, or this is your first day to ever hear it, God is willing to grant you eternal life. Jesus said, all who come to me in this this uh, uh, gospel, I will never cast out. All, whoever believes. And so you can't walk away without knowing what that means tonight. It's the key in this verse as to where you're going to spend eternity. And so please listen to this last point. Whoever believes is what we call faith. And there are four aspects of faith. No one ever sat me down and showed me these four aspects, and I want to show them to you tonight. Faith is what will save you. And the first is the knowledge of the gospel. And I have given that to you tonight, and that is God's gift that he sent his son into this world to die on a cross for your sins and save you. You need to have a knowledge of that. The second part is you need to have an assent to this gospel. And you say, I, I get it. The Son of God came in and He really entered this world. There's more evidence and proofs of it. He came into this world. I'm assenting to this truth. And then third, you have to accept it for yourself. So it can't just be He did it for everybody. Uh, he did it for my good Uncle Jim. It, it has to be for you tonight. God saves individuals. And as you sit before Him tonight, you have a big decision. Will you accept this salvation that God has given in His Son? And listen to this, He's giving it again tonight. He's, he's offering it to you. And He's giving His Son to anyone who will receive Him tonight for yourself. It's offered and He's ready to give Christ to you and give you salvation and eternal life. And the fourth part of faith is a personal trust or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bank everything on this truth. I believe it, and I'm going to live for this. It's to throw away everything else that you're trusting in to get right with God. And for some, it's hard. You've got to throw out all of your good works that you think by being a good person can get you right with God. And tonight, I'm telling you, all that can do is get you away from God and incur His wrath. You can't do enough good works to be in the presence of God. He's perfect. And so you, tonight you have to let go of continuing to look at being a good person and get right with God. Maybe it's your reputation. I, I, I remember when my poor brother Steve got saved. It's, it's beautiful to be saved, but he had six brothers who abused him like no other. And I happened to be one of them. And, and, and when I got you know, saved, I wasn't excited to get beat up by the other five. And so maybe tonight it's, you're afraid of what others are going to say because you've made fun of God like me your whole life and now you're going to love him 
and surrender your life and follow him? And you've got to give that up? Maybe it's your religion. You've been a Methodist or a Lutheran or a Baptist your whole life, and, and, and that can't save you. And tonight, you might have to let go of being in church for 50 years, and you haven't been born again, and you've never come to this point of trust and faith. Maybe it's that you're better than everyone in this bad world today, and you just feel good about yourself. Tonight, you're going to have to give that up. Will you trust in Jesus Christ alone and what he has done to bring salvation into this world? Peter says you're to fix your hope with finality. I'm going to bank everything on this. I believe it. I assent to it. I'm going to entrust my life to this. Will you trust in Jesus Christ tonight? Will you put an end to running away from God every day in this gospel? And you got a million arguments and you just keep running. I'm asking you tonight to put an end to that. God is commanding you this night to believe in the gift that he gave this world. His only begotten son so that you will not perish but have everlasting life. And so in the quietness of your heart, as we sing these last songs, I'm asking you to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And just do business with your soul in God, no one else around. This has to be dealt with, and you can't keep pushing it off to another time. Today is the day of salvation. I pray. Merry Christmas. What a gift that God has given to us. Amen? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this gospel. I thank you for John 3.16. I thank you for a God who loved the world like this, that he gave up the best that he had, his own son, to come in to save it, to live the, the life that we couldn't, came and perfectly obeyed your law. God, thank you for that. Thank you for letting him represent us Thank you that he represented us on a cross. He died in our place for our sins so that we could be forgiven and have eternal life instead of perishing. God, let that overwhelm every heart, no matter what darkness they're feeling this season, the loneliness. Let the love of God fill their heart, encourage their souls, and lift them. They have eternal life. God, bless them. Burn off uh, depression, sadness, sorrow. Burn it off tonight. Bless them. Bless them, encourage their hearts and the gift that God gave this world. God, I thank you for Jesus Christ. And it's in that precious, perfect, beautiful, sweet name that we do pray. Amen.